So today I'm presenting, obviously, about aromatherapy certification. Um, I've been involved with the aromatherapy um, world for over 30 years now. And just to give a little bit of background, I received my original aromatherapy training in the UK, in England. I was trained as a traditional holistic aromatherapist, which means I learned <clears throat> uh, to integrate essential oils basically into massage, reflexology. We learned applied kinesiology, uh, which is like a muscle testing, anatomy and physiology, basic counseling, basic nutrition. And I did live and work in England uh, for a couple of years before returning to the United States. Um, when I returned to the United States, it was 1991. And aromatherapy was barely known in the United States, um, whereas in England it had been kind of on this growth uh, kind of trajectory, so to speak. So I wanted to create my aromatherapy practice here in Boston, Massachusetts specifically, and I needed to become licensed as a massage therapist, which thankfully at that time, I just had to sit an exam and show that I knew draping techniques and whatnot, safety uh, guidelines. And so I practiced in Boston, but what I found is no one really knew what aromatherapy was. So I started teaching uh, courses um, at aesthetic schools, continuing education um, facilities, uh, massage uh, schools as well, and wrote my first blending manual in 1992-93. And I mean, it's really just been 30 years of teaching and writing and working with and practicing and researching um, essential oils. And of course, if you, if you do know me, I'm also a big gardener, so I work a lot with the aromatic plants themselves, uh, both in my home garden, and I'll be sharing with you <clears throat> towards the end of the presentation about our farm facility, which is opening in 2022 for live classes, um, particularly on distillation. So let's dive in. So this year has been really transformative for me and for the school. Um, certainly, actually, I would say the last seven years um, with the last two years being truly pivotal um, and myself being very, very clear about where we're going for a, as a school, um, who I am as an educator. So this is our mission statement, which is to inspire and empower the next generation of aromatherapist through balanced, progressive, and relevant education and experience. And we'll talk about what I mean by the new generation in a moment. I think a lot about aromatherapy and essential oils, and I, you know, I can imagine the overwhelm to anyone kind of coming into the field or looking at schools or products and whatnot, because it is like a huge industry. And there's a lot of um, controversial issues and differences of opinions, which can be really difficult to kind of find your way through. So for me personally, how I have found the balance, kind of the center point between what I perceive as very extreme um, opinions um, is this, that I believe empowerment, confidence, and the true heart of aromatherapy is about our relationship. So, do you know, because in a very uh, grounded, embodied relationship with essential oils, we can begin to build our own relationship and kind of take these, you know, little bits of information we might find on social media and really put them into context, um, yeah, uh, in, into our work and into our relationship with essential oils. So, for me, building relationships means we build it with the essential oils. So each essential oil in our repertoire, aromatic plants, if you have the opportunity, I highly recommend. 
Um, and then of course, a huge thing is to have a relationship with the body and what it is in health and in ill health or when we go out of homeostatic balance, so to speak. We also build relationships with each other, whether we disagree or agree on certain issues. We build relationships with the wider community of holistic health and wellness practitioners, because as we'll kind of have a brief look at, you know, there are limitations as to what essential oils can do for our health. So, and then building a relationship with emerging empirical and evidence-based information. And we're gonna have a look at that as well. So, but truly the most grounded embodied place to come from is not only your education, but just really cultivating that relationship specifically with the essential oils. So my objectives in this presentation, we're gonna talk kind of about the wider scope of where aromatherapy fits in right now within the wellness industry itself. Then we're gonna have a look at certification standards. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I consider the new generation or the next generation. We'll look at career possibilities. And of course, I'll introduce you to the school. So while we're going through this, these questions are going to come up at the end, but while we're going through this discussion, something I'd love to have you just kind of keep in your own mind is what is your vision for why you are interested in studying aromatherapy? Do you know what is pulling you into the world of essential oils? Um, <clears throat> maybe you already have some passion about around a kind of a specific area you'd like to focus on. What steps do you need to take to manifest your vision? Sorry, I need to drink. And if you're thinking about creating a business, will you thrive as a self-employed person or do you see yourself working within like a community or a company like structure? So these are just questions I'd like you to have at the back of your mind. So this is a look at um, the broader industry, which is, and all right. So looking at the, the very kind of umbrella of where aromatherapy fits in with specifically global wellness. So global wellness is a $4.5 trillion industry. And that was actually in 2018. It's grown even more over the past couple of years. So we're, we're talking about just this enormous industry of which aromatherapy comes under. So if we look at the key sectors, we have personal care, beauty and anti-aging, um, which essential oils, aromatherapy, you know, our carrier oils all fit into. We have wellness tourism, which is, you know, visiting uh, farms, um, like our school that I, I feel fits into that wellness tourism. Uh, fitness and body mind, uh, preventative personalized medicine, traditional complementary therapy, wellness lifestyle, spa, thermal and mineral springs, and workplace wellness. So aromatherapy is a part of this global wellness. Um, okay. And particularly when we look at mental health, and I'm sure if, if you've been watching the news or reading different uh, publications or following different people on social media, there has been an enormous rise of mental health issues over the last couple of years um, due to the pandemic. Um, but even before that, you know, even before the pandemic set in, I was doing research <clears throat> on kind of the leading causes of death here in the United States uh, specifically. And one of the top five was death, deaths of despair. So that is drug overdose, suicide, you know, et cetera. And so mental health has definitely kind of risen to the top of things we can do, I think, as aromatherapist to support people. So mental wellness is a $121 billion, glo billion dollar global market. That was in 2019. Uh, the pandemic has sent that even higher. 
Um, and the market consists of basically four subsectors. So we're going to have a look at that because this is like so beautiful for the potential of aromatherapy to come into play in each of these categories. So I think particularly of interest is the senses, spaces, and sleep. So we have, you know, obviously supporting um, what we call sleep hygiene, that people are getting enough sleep because the lack of proper sleep, of course, has um, just a wide range of health impact um, issues from not getting enough sleep. Where I think is a uh, prevalent to aromatherapy as well as the sensory spaces, do you know, to have our senses evoked, but be a taste, auditory, our sense of smell, touch, et cetera, um, there, it's on the rise, do you know, whether even uh, um, smell training, which we're going to talk about um, in, when we get to uh, career potential. Then we have meditation and mindfulness, which includes the studios, uh, centers, and teachers. Again, a beautiful place to bring aromatics, essential oils into. Brain-boosting nutraceuticals and botanicals. Another area where I, I believe essential oils have a role to play. Do you know, I know as a postmenopausal woman, kind of cognitive, keeping cognitive, good, healthy cognitive functions, memory, do you know, I'm, I take not only supplements, but also I add, of course, essential oils like rosemary, basil, um, just to help improve uh, cognitive function as I age. So, and I think that that's going to be relevant to a growing um, older population um, throughout the world. And then we have just self-improvement. And these are things we can, you know, share in our community and help people utilize essential oils um, for different self-help issues. Okay. I also wanted just to touch base here before we dive into aromatherapy certification. The, the, the power of our sense of smell alone, do you know, is quite extraordinary just because of the way olfaction interacts with the amygdala and then that part of our brain, the structures are called the limbic system. So our sense of smell, you know, just doing inhalations, diffusing into our environment can build, help build resiliency, which is our ability to come back or prevent the negative impacts of stress on our body and mind. Uh, it provides a sensory experience. It can, you know, doing inhalation can reduce and alleviate stress and anxiety, <clears throat> can relieve pain by altering pain perception, relieve uh, insomnia, improve memory, support the prevention of neurodegenerative diseases, you know, like Alzheimer's, a Parkinson's. These are diseases that are becoming more and more common, tragically. But there is a role of essential oils um, to play in preventing them, because some of the evidence being shown today is that some of these neurodegenerative diseases are arising because of a you know a lengthy um, span of of being under stress, you know. So stress has a huge impact on our future health, and so I think the use of essential oils just has a really powerful role to play with uh, this particular issue. So our sense of smell also um, can increase alertness. Um, affect and improve our mood. I mean, if you've ever been in an aromatherapy class, you see instantly people begin to shift how they feel once, you know, we start smelling essential oils, there's a giddiness, there's, they want to talk. Um, it just tends to improve, yeah, our affect or our mood. Increase overall emotional well-being, which really addresses that, um, rise in the need for mental health uh, support and intervention. Our sense of smell can help ease physical ailments, particularly those that are stress related or triggered by stress. And our sense of smell helps shape our impression of self 
and others. Do you know, meaning like sometimes we walk into someone's house and the smell is like, ah, you know, I really want to be in here. And, or we meet someone and unconsciously the smell is like that. Nah, I don't connect with them. So it does help to shape our impressions of self and others in kind of a unconscious way, but it shows the importance of our sense of smell. Okay, so now we're gonna dive into aromatherapy around the world. Aromatherapy is incredibly popular all over. I mean, we have students, we call it, it's a global community for sure. Um, from large countries to small countries. So aromatherapy is all over. And, and we're gonna have a look at um, kind of the education that's happening. So there are some leading organizations currently in aromatherapy. Uh, the, and so the first two are the United States. There's NAHA, which is the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy. And then there's the AIA, which is the Alliance of International Aromatherapists. And then in England, we have IFPA, which is probably one of the most widely um, known aromatherapy organizations in the UK, although they have many. Um, the CFA represents the Canadian Federation of Aromatherapy, and there's also um, a couple of smaller organizations in Canada. And then another one uh, well known is the one in Australia, which is the International Aromatherapy and Aromatic Medicine Association. And I believe there may be one other in Australia. There are organizations um, being formed all over the world um, as well right now. I believe actually there's a Japanese association as well. So the leading organizations are what sets educational standards for aromatherapy. I think it's important before we dive into the standards to understand our history as aromatherapist. So, much of the world adopted what's what I call the English model. And what this means is that within this model, you know, I'm quite fond of, of models because it helps guide, you know, what we do and how we assess our, our clients and how we select our essential oils and what we focus on. <clears throat> so with the English model, which is how I was trained, we have massage, reflexology, a really uh, good understanding of the impact of stress on health and wellness. Uh, it does only include external applications, so applications to the skin or olf olfactory um, type of applications. It includes a diet and nutrition. When I was trained, that was quite limited. I don't know if it has grown over the years, but at least we got some um, training within that field. Basic counseling, because in England, when you're trained as an aromatherapist, a part of your role is to really talk to the person, to talk to your client, to explore different issues with them. And then applied kinesiology, which is a form of muscle testing that helps us select essential oils. Another model um, is what we call, so just going back to the English model, that is what most of the world has picked up, the, the English approach or model to training aromatherapists. Some countries have dropped the massage and we're gonna talk about that in a moment. So within this new model, the French model, um, the difference between the English and the French is basically the French model includes internal use. And I know it's an incredibly controversial issue and I'll give you my opinion in a moment, um, but internal use, external applications with quite a range of dilutions. Um, whereas in the English model, we tend to use lower dilutions. In the French model, dilutions can go up much higher, even to a one-to-one -one type of application. Of course, olfaction is used, and it tends to be a more pathology-based approach um, than, say, the holistic approach of uh, traditional holistic aromatherapy education. 
And then we have what I call the new or the next generation. And this is really kind of merging the French and the English. Um, you know, I really believe in empowering our students and myself, most important, um, to utilize essential oil safely and effectively in all its potential. So to me, the next generation merges the French and the English. So we have this understanding of stress, we have internal use, olfaction, inhalation, we have hydrosols being used internally and externally, of course, dermal application, and an understanding of the impact of diet and nutrition on health and wellness as well. Okay, so this to me, is the next generation. And it will depend on what country you live in, uh, what your, you know, what organization you belong to, um, whether you can do this, you know, say the internal use aspect. So um, we'll explore a little bit of that. Each country and each organization has set its own educational standards. The ones I am going to be presenting in the next three slides are specific to the National Association for Holistic Aromatherapy. And I was um, involved, I was a part of the education committee in the 90s uh, when level one and level two were finalized and then uh, level three as well. I was involved with uh, the board um, as we kind of developed level three. So level one includes all of these subjects and the minimum is 50 hours. The goal of this particular level at the time that it was created was really about training existing massage therapists. Because this is a US standard, our understanding, well, we couldn't open up schools that taught massage because massage was heavily regulated here in the United States and continues to be. So when we began teaching aromatherapy here in the United States, our market basically was massage therapist. So then as the years kind of evolved and uh, there was a huge expansion um, in the aromatherapy field, who is practicing or who is utilizing essential oils, I really began to see level one kind of as a family uh, orientated uh, practitioner um, for those who have pre existing professions, for those just entering the field of aromatherapy. But it is a minimum of 50 hours of training. Level two, which is kind of more the curriculum that is, is prevalent around uh, the world, includes these subjects. I'm not going to read them all. And you will get a, a copy of this PowerPoint sent to you after the presentation. So it's just a lot more hours, a lot more uh, you know, information. Like it goes a lot more in depth than say a foundations a curriculum would go into. So that's level two. And again, this is mostly without the massage, what most uh, organizations around the world um, pretty much uh, include as well. Level three came about because um, there was just a growing need and interest to uh, enhance some of the education aromatherapists were receiving. Um, NAHA, I believe, is a very progressive organization within the field of aromatherapy. Not only myself as past president, but the existing past president really believed um, in people getting educated for aromatic medicine, so the internal use of essential oils. Um, and so level three kind of came out at a time when uh, we wanted to broaden um, the understanding of, of aromatic medicine and, and aromatherapy. So these are the curriculum guidelines uh, for level three, a minimum of 300 hours. And some, some schools kind of start with like level two and it's, you know, like 
level two and then eventually a level three. So they merge their foundations with their, their level uh, two program as well. So you, you will come across that. And then each of these levels include certain requirements. So they may have case study requirements. Foundations is like five case studies. A uh, level three can be 14 to 20 case studies actually. A uh, level two, uh, part of the US requirement, and I'm not sure if this is uh, required in other countries, but here in the United States and to become a member of NAHA at a level two, you also have to write a research paper. It's eight to 10 pages long. And by research paper, it doesn't literally mean research, like everything has to be like PubMed. You know, it could just be a paper um, on something you have a, a passion for an interest of. And then all levels include a final exam. And this would be global as well. Um, to graduate from an aromatherapy school, you need to complete the final exam successfully. And typically passing grades are at like 70%. I think it's important uh, to have a very clear understanding because I think sometimes it's presented incorrectly um, through different companies or th definitely through social media. Schools are what certify you as an aromatherapist. An association does not certify you, okay? That's a really important thing to understand. So when you say, I have a certification, you say where you got that from, do you know which school you studied with? An aromatherapy association, wherever it is in the world, is really a membership organization, kind of a social a group, so to speak, or where you can get a continuing education in the field. But it's a membership organization and each organization around the world has their own unique way of providing designations based upon their educational requirements, right? So you wouldn't say I'm NAHA certified. You would say I'm a certified aromatherapist through whatever school and I am a professional member of NAHA. So I hope that makes sense. Because you sometimes see I'm IFPA certified, I'm NAHA certified, and, and that's not correct. It's about being a member of the organization. So, and then the next issue is licensure. There is no license anywhere in the world for aromatherapists with the exception being in South Africa. So in the United States, we have healthcare freedom laws, um, and then each country will have its own position on the practice of aromatherapy, if any. You know, it's, in some countries, it's an emerging practice. So, you know, it still has a ways to go um, in different countries. I think it's also important, I'll just touch base real quick on evidence base. I don't wanna to spend too much time here. But I see a lot of schools or, you know, just books or whatever saying, you know, we're evidence based. And I thought I'd give you a brief, just a quick glance into what that means and why I think, you know, it's, it's valuable, but not, um, not um, always what it, it appears to be. So what does evidence-based education mean? And this is uh, some quotes from Ken Miller, who wrote just a fantastic uh, piece on evidence base. What does that mean? And so even within the aromatherapy field, much of the research that is shared is based on animal studies, which is considered the lowest form of evidence of which we can base our claims on. Um, but it's also, it's, you know, it's an attempt by the field to provide validity, right? <coughs> Sorry about that. But evidence-based medicine is really only considered valid if humans have been subjects of the study. And that's really kind of the main point I, I want to have you walk away with, I guess, is, and, and those are not as widely, although it's growing, widely available as the animal studies or like in uh, vitro. 
I think I also want to say with this quote I have is that sometimes it's downplayed by different people in the field um, that our experience isn't important, but I do think our experience is actually really important um, and that we share our experiences with one another um, because that way we can begin to see potential patterns um, in the efficacy of essential oils for different health conditions or emotional um, imbalances. So, and our observations matter, right? <clears throat> Be it what, what we use on ourselves or what we um, use on clients or customers. Yep. Sorry, I'm shortening some of these discussions because there's a lot in this presentation. Um, recently, I gave a talk with Naha actually called uh, The New Generation. And this was a chart I created um, for that presentation as well as it kind of helped me understand where, you know, there's potential in the field or the practice or use or, you know, where we, why we would want to study aromatherapy as well. So essential oils can be kind of utilized in diverse ways or fields. So the first one is family and self-care, which is really about using essential oils for wellness and then acute and common health conditions. Do you know this? It's one of my biggest kind of loves of essential oils is to how I've been able to use them for my son, my husband, myself. Um, and always we need to, um, in that form of practice to respect our limitations. Um, do you know, it's like what we feel comfortable with if we have guidance or support um, in utilizing essential oils for, um, for the, yeah, I think you understand. Then we have uh, community educators or practitioners. And with community educators and practitioners, we again have this use of essential oils for general health and wellness, acute and common health conditions, and to educate the community on how to safely and effectively utilize essential oils. Then we move into the practitioner category. And this is where practitioners tend to be able to treat kind of more chronic health conditions, um, utilizing various tools. It may just be essential oils. It may also include herbs, um, nutrition, exercise, just different lifestyle factors. But under the category of practitioners, we have licensed professionals, we have wellness consultants, and then we have unlicensed professions. Okay, and we're gonna look at that in the next slide. The next group would be botanical body care product formulators. So this is either you're making skincare products for yourself and for home use, family, friends, et cetera, or you're actually formulating <clears throat> for a specific product line. Sorry, I'm so congested. <clears throat> so if you're formulating for a product line, obviously you're gonna want a lot more in-depth education on how to do this than like kind of home use. So there, there are two separate um, categories there. And then there's a growing um, interest and market in what we call animal aromatherapy or aromatherapy for pets. There's only a kind of a handful of educators in that field, but there's you know, a growing group of practitioners working with essential oils and animals. <clears throat> if we look at professionals in the aromatherapy field, and again, this is relevant to the United States, but could be relevant in your country as well. So we have a licensed uh, practitioners, so like medical doctors, nurses, psychologists, social workers, massage therapists, and estheticians. And then we have unlicensed uh, professionals, such as aromatherapists, wellness advocates, herbalists, uh, yoga practitioners, etc. Okay, so there's both licensed and unlicensed um, practitioners 
uh, utilizing aromatherapy. <clears throat> Depending on, this is to me the new kind of a new generation or a growing aspect to aromatherapy. We're seeing uh, different models brought in um, to kind of how we relate to, build our relationship with um, the essential oils, but also how we perceive uh, the imbalances incurring in our own bodies, clients, customers, um, people we work with. And so I just wanted to kind of offer this up as part of our aromatherapy certification talk because you know there's there's many ways or lenses one can come into aromatherapy. I do want to say in, let's say Ayurveda, TCM, and Western herbal energetics, these are evolving, <clears throat> right, with the integration of essential oils, because they do not have historical uses of essential oils per se, as we know them today. So the writing in that field is, is very innovative, do you know? Ayurveda, we have David Crow at Floricopia. I helped co-write um, the course uh, for him, with him on Ayurveda and aromatherapy. Um, there was a, another author, I can't remember her name right now. Um, anyhow, there's one other book with Ayurveda and essential oils. TCM, this is really uh, highlighted in the work of Peter Holmes. And then we have Western Herbal Energetics, and that also is something we've been working on or I've been working on with the school. Uh, uh, it's part of our aromatic medicine program. It's just another lens of seeing um, what's happening in the human body and then helping us select uh, specific essential oils. So an example would be, you know, we, we work with spectrums, hot, cold, dry, moist. So hot, doesn't necessarily, it's not like a temperature. Hot means excess, like overly stimulated. So what we say, say, okay, there's excess heat happening. So we want to use essential oils that are cooling, right? We use the opposite. So cooling essential oils are those essential oils, not cooling in temperature, but slow the processes, calm, do you know? So if someone was anxious, which is seen as an excess, we could use coriander seed and lavender because those cool and calm the excess, they slow the nervous system, okay? Then we have other energetic systems that are growing in the field like chakras. We also have um, astrology. You know, there's some intersection of astrology and health imbalances, and even with trauma, which I think is a really interesting um, growth field. And then, of course, traditional biomedical, uh, where we look at the pathology of the condition and treat accordingly. This is new generation as well. So tools that we can kind of maybe learn about um, as part or an extension of our aromatherapy training. So the growth of herbal medicine has been phenomenal over the past couple of years. I believe it's a really valuable tool for aromatherapist. Um, nutrition and diet, sleep hygiene, we talked about. Becoming trauma informed, I believe, is, is going to be a growing uh, topic in the field of aromatherapy. It's already a very big topic in the world of herbal medicine. A tongue assessment, it's a, just a tool for assessing, is there excess heat? Is there dampness? Is it dry? Is it inflamed? Um, we can see a lot of um, health imbalances by looking at the tongue. And then applied kinesiology, as I said, is a muscle testing. We have pulse diagnosis, which is Ayurveda and TCM have, uh, and Western herbal energetics have a method of, um, <clears throat> it's really an assessment versus diagnosis um, of what imbalances might be happening in the body. Reflexology is used both, you know, to treat as well as to, as a diagnostic tool. You can see quite a lot in people's feet. Um, and then iridology, so which is looking at the um, eye, the iris, and uh, assessing imbalances in that way. 
So these are just tools that can enhance um, practices or kind of the lens, like I said, that, that, that you come from or you, you choose. So who is the new generation? Do you know who is the aromatherapist? Do you know, in some countries, there is a cohesive identity to who the aromatherapist is. So let's say in England, when I say I'm an aromatherapist, there's an understanding of the, the framework in which I practice within, right? As an aromatherapist, I'm gonna do a consultation, I'm gonna customize a blend, and I'm gonna perform some type of massage or reflexology. My focus um, in traditional holistic aromatherapy is really about reducing the impact of stress <clears throat> and reducing stress-related health conditions. So, but in other parts of the world, I would say there's less of a cohesive identity to who the aromatherapist is because there's such a huge possibility, right? Just looking back at that chart, we just looked at home practitioners, you know, the licensed, unlicensed, botanical body care formulators, um, an animal aromatherapist. So it's like, and then who the aroma, it could be a psychologist, a social worker, a massage therapist. Do you know that's just a huge range, I think, in most countries with who the aromatherapist actually is. Um, and really, it, yeah, just, it, I think I like that way that there's just a huge potential on um, who, who we are. Uh, another part of the new generation is to become less reactionary uh, to different stances within the community. Um, there is a place to find balance and acceptance. Um, I think it's really important to recognize that we need to agree to disagree. Do you know there's there's colleagues I continue to disagree with, and and that's okay. It's it's you know it's not a respect issue. It's just an opinion that we disagree. And so I think that needs to become more, um, more accepted in our field that we just need to agree to disagree within, you know, a rational framework, I guess. New generation, I think we also need to um, kind of start looking at, you know, this is like discernment, what is the information being presented and how, how is that relevant to me and how I practice or utilize essential oils? I think really the next generation and this new generation arising, there, I, I encourage a, a movement away from fear-based thinking. Um, do you know so much, what I teach in our classes and to our students is that we should not build our relationship or our practice in aromatherapy uh, based in reaction to the perceived wrongdoings of a group of people, right? I don't want to base my relationship or use of essential oils out of fear. And I think, you know, there, and this goes back to when I was talking about relationship, that it is your relationship with essential oils that will overcome the fear-based kind of information that we see on social media. I think the new generation of aromatherapy practitioners or individuals utilizing essential oils, we really need to become trauma-informed and to have a very good and healthy understanding of what that means. So, and I'm gonna just touch base on that in a moment. There's definitely new generation, we need to move beyond there's an oil for that, right? Because there's an oil for that concept is really about just treating the surface of people's health conditions or matters or concerns. And that, you know, we need to go a little bit deeper and understanding how it is that imbalance is being manifest, right? So if someone has a headache, there can be a variety of reasons that's triggering the headache. It could be stress related. It could be something they ate. It could be, you know, an allergy. It could be hormonal. It could be tension. 
So I think that's what I'm talking about that, oh, it's not just, oh, they have a headache, let's use this essential oil, but rather what is, let me see if I can explore some of the root causes, what's contributing to that, and then select my essential oils for that. And finally, with the next generation or new generation, I think understanding the limitations of aromatherapy is a standalone therapy. Do you know, essential oils are so incredible for so many things, but for sure, they also have the, their limitations. And I want to just share an example of, you know, I work with kind of what is called a functional herbalist, right? A herbalist that emphasizes a lot on nutrition. And she was working with someone who'd had psoriasis. And so as an aromatherapist, I look at psoriasis and I would think, okay, I want to use, you know, omega-3 rich uh, fatty acid uh, carrier oils. So like raspberry seed, um, <clears throat> let me see what else, uh, blackberry seed, uh, pomegranate seed would be useful as well. And then anti-inflammatory, um, anti-pyritic, like anti-itchy um, uh, essential oils. So that's how I would approach it. But where she approached it was through some dietary changes. She made some dietary adjustments, um, kind of other factors, mostly around food, diet. And it was remarkable, actually, that the psoriasis ended up um, going away, like, like resolving, which was incredible. And this was over a two to three month period of um, her client working actively on changing her diet. So, you know, this is where, again, we, we want to move away from this surface level of treatment and maybe or, or application of essential oils and understand a little bit deeper about other tools we may want to look at to really help um, the person heal. And, and I do want to say that one case study uh, with psoriasis was, was not necessarily uh, you know, a common response, uh, or well, it could be common, but you know, it was pretty extraordinary. Even Lindsay was surprised by um, how well the client responded to the shift in her diet. So I hope that that makes sense to, to you. Okay, so we've kind of touched base on aromatherapy certification. Once you become a certified aromatherapist, let's talk about the possibilities you have in career potential. So we're gonna cover some career and business opportunities, including new and rising uh, career opportunities in the field. But I do want to say, in all honesty, do you know, it's not always easy. It's not like you get certified in aromatherapy and boom, you're earning $50 to $100 an hour or your product's selling like hotcakes. You know, it takes a lot of work. And then, of course, just the pandemic years have taught us that in a moment's time, things can change and shift. Um, I see businesses, we were just out last night um to go see a movie and part the theater was a part of kind of this small mall in our area and the entire mall all the stores had closed down over the past two years i mean it was a little bit tragic really to to walk through it but it's happening all over the world so you know you can you can <clears throat> plan the best for your business but i guess i just want to be honest um that it it you know, sometimes unexpected things happen. I remember years ago, um, actually, when the tsunami happened in Japan, um, there was a lot of shifts around the spa industry shortly thereafter. And that affected a, a number of companies, uh, people I knew, um, whose primary market was in Japan, suddenly their, their product line wasn't selling. So, and, and then they had to shift careers. Um, or change how they were working with essential oils or shift their business and what they were marketing towards. So, you know, just keep that in mind. I, I think 
with any field, whether it's massage or herbal medicine or aromatherapy, it really is a huge commitment. Um, and it's completely possible to do really well as well. Um, but it also takes this, you wanna be clear, what's your vision? What are your skills? What is your time commitment um, to accomplish your vision? What are your inherent abilities? What abilities might you need to kind of cultivate in yourself? Um, what skills might you look outside yourself for that you need for your business idea? Um, do you need additional education? Do you have a support team? That could be family, friends, um, or hiring employees. And what are your financial resources, et cetera? Do you know, so as you enter, or start thinking about, oh, what do I want to do with aromatherapy? You know, along with those, what's your vision? What do you want to create? What are your goals? Um, these are other aspects you want to be thinking about. So the first uh, possibility with aromatherapy is to integrate it into your existing practice, whether you're a massage therapist, an esthetician, a herbalist, social worker, et cetera. By studying aromatherapy, I think it's a great um, aspect to integrate into your existing practice. You can also, of course, create an aromatherapy business. So to create aromatherapy body care or skincare lines, you can sell essential oils, create a wellness line, create products for your practice. So this is, you know, the, just on the business um, side of uh, possibilities um, that you can do uh, with essential oils. Another one is to become an aromatherapy community educator. And I say community educator because I think it's really important to educate your community, people you come into contact with who have an interest in aromatherapy to teach them how to safely and effectively utilize aromatherapy for self-care, for their family health care uh, and wellness. And then once you're qualified, you know, over a period of time, maybe I, I recommend one to two years of working with essential oils before entering this part, which is to teach certification programs or continuing education uh, programs for aromatherapists and other essential oil uh, users. Hospice and palliative care is becoming um, incredibly interested and has been for a number of years actually on utilizing essential oils and aromatherapy, not only for physical um, uh, diseases such as wound healing, but also for psychological mental health well being. So, this is a growth area for nurses, massage therapists, and aromatherapists working together in hospice and palliative care facilities. As I mentioned before, I'm a big, you know, I'm going to definitely be talking a lot more about the role of aromatics and trauma in the new year, um, because I think it's just a really important topic um, for us as aromatherapists to uh, become knowledgeable in. And so we have the role of aromatics in healing trauma can be um, much larger, I believe, than maybe it's currently being used. And then if you know uh, Bessel uh, van der, van der Kolk, um, who wrote a book called The Body Keeps the Score, he talks a lot about limbic system therapy. And so it's really, in his view, he approaches it from kind of somatics, the body itself. But I see a much larger potential here on the integration of essential oils, because of course, our sense of smell is directly, it's one synapse away from the amygdala. And then the amygdala and the limbic system uh, structures are all basically trying to tell the hypothalamus what to do, which basically means that just inhaling essential oils can have this body-wide impact um, through the central nervous system, but even more importantly, through the autonomic nervous system. So I think there's a huge role um, 
as aromatherapy continues to evolve in what I call somatics and aromatics, right? Integrating our sense of sm smell with somatic um, and trauma healing. So I'm not gonna go too in depth with this, but what I mean by becoming trauma informed is to recognize the prevalence of trauma among people, do you know, that there's few of us who have not had some type of, of trauma and there's different types, right? There's acute, there's complex, there's developmental, um, but then to have a real good understanding of the impact on, of trauma on physical, emotional and mental health, um, to recognize that many behaviors and symptoms are the result of traumatic experiences recognize that being treated with respect and kindness and being empowered with choices are key in helping people recover from traumatic experiences. And as practitioners or people interacting with clients and customers, um, the goal of becoming trauma-informed is clearly to avoid re-traumatizing someone. So, and again, we're gonna go touch on these subjects in the new year, new year um, a lot more. There's a huge rise of potential uh, for aromatherapists to um, offer smell training. Do you know, it, it has been shown in several studies that smell training is incredibly effective um, to uh, restore the sense of smell um, or improve the sense of smell. You know, remember years ago, way before it's so popular now, I would say that our sense of smell is like a muscle, that the more we exercise it, the stronger it becomes. And of course, in today, um, we know for sure that utilizing, consciously utilizing our sense of smell does increase our olfactory awareness um, it expands our olfactory palate. And one of the triggers for the rise in olfactory training is, of course, COVID, which many people lose their sense of smell, and many people thankfully get it back. Um, but also sometimes some people really need the support of smell training. I had COVID um, last or this past March. I did lose my sense of smell. It was awful. <laughs> and, um, but, and it took many months. It took, I would say from onset of the loss of sense of smell, it took about two to three months for it to completely return and maybe six months for me to feel 100% back to, you know, normal. Anyhow, this is definitely a huge uh, growth uh, market uh, potential for aromatherapist. This to me is new generation aromatherapy. This is a rising or an emerging um, market for us that we can uh, work within or if you have land um, to become a grower of aromatic and medicinal plants. So this is the front of my cabin at our farm in uh, Virginia. I have a quite a large garden and then hopefully in the next year we'll put up our greenhouse. But, you know, growing medicinal plants is, is yeah, there's a huge demand um, and I don't think that's going to be going anywhere. And it also helps us uh, when we become growers, we can help in regener regenerating the forest but also potentially grow plants where there's sustainability concerns um, to have like kind of a niche uh, market, so to speak, in uh, that, that part, you know, where plants are not sustainable, where they're traditionally or native to, we could potentially grow a crop um, and fulfill the, the, at least a small part of that market. Also to become a distiller, uh, you know, so, so when we distill, uh, we 
can produce hydrosols, which is a growing area for the distillation process. So many uh, people, such as myself, are distilling uh, aromatic plant material, not for the essential oil, because we just don't grow enough plant material to produce any large quantity of essential oil, but we can get a considerable amount of hydrosol. And hydrosols just have extraordinary therapeutic activity. They had been used historically in pharmacies and in uh, medicine, like herbal medicine. So it creates a, yeah, an area that you could potentially go into um, through your studies of aromatherapy. So you can distill to produce hydrosols, distill to produce essential oils or an essential oil or two essential oils, depending on how much land you have. Um, yeah, and how much plant material you can grow. And then also for me, I, you know, in 2022, we're offering distillation classes. Part of my experience of distillation is to use it as a tool of personal transformation through interacting with the aromatic plants, harvesting, preparing, distilling, observing, and of course, the end, you know, having the hydrosol to work with is just incredibly transformative on so many levels. So there's different instructors and Harmon who wrote hydrosol book um, is, is, is there as well um, in um, Washington state, uh, Liz Fulcher in uh, Pennsylvania, Myself, of course, as I said, we're going to be offering distillation retreats in the new year. We do also have a free uh, hydrosol course that I did with uh, my friend and colleague Ildiko um, in Crete, who, where she distills. So it's, it's really an incredible um, field and experience if you, if you haven't um, experienced it yet. So over the years, do you know, I've, I have been a practitioner in aromatherapy and, you know, a researcher and an educator, but there is no part of aromatherapy that means more to me than being empowered to take care of my family, myself, and my friends. So, do you know, becoming a family aromatherapist, I do believe there's a minimum amount of training one would, would want to really feel fully empowered. So, do you know, I personally recommend the foundations of aromatherapy or essential oil therapy, and I'll talk about the differences in a moment, and then some short programs just to enhance your knowledge um, on specific subjects. Do you know, my, my son here, Soren, he grew up with hydrosols and essential oils. Um, and yeah, I think he, he you know, loves, loves natural medicine. He, he would let me utilize tinctures or, yeah, we had just different rituals we did, you know, for sleep with lavender hydrosol or, you know, I, I can honestly say he, he didn't have any over-the-counter medication um, ever actually and then only a couple of antibiotics uh, as he got older he had a couple of bouts of um, strep throat which i believe do need to be treated with antibiotics um, so it doesn't become systemic but otherwise he's been raised um, with essential oils and herbal medicine and and i know for myself it's my core um, means of of supporting my own health and treating different imbalances that arise. Additional possibilities uh, to become a writer, be it for blogs, magazines, to write a book, et cetera. Um, health coach and wellness advocate is a growing uh, part of our industry. Um, and become a formulator or consultant, be it to Yogi Teas or you know, different companies that are beginning to integrate um, or want to improve their formulations. So there's definitely a huge potential there as well. Okay, so I'm going to just share now a little bit about the school and then we'll go into some questions. So, you know, obviously when we do a webinar, we want to talk about where we're at as a school. So 
Um, it's a school for aromatic studies. We were one of the first schools here in North America. It was founded in 1991. We do have a global community. So we have students and graduates all over the world. As I shared in the beginning, we're devoted to balanced, progressive and empowering education. We are brand neutral. So we do not teach through a specific product line. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, if you are becoming educated in aromatherapy, that it is brand neutral. They're, they're not teaching through their own uh, brand. Not that brands are bad, but education, it's not that company's lavender. We want to know about lavender, right? It's not that company's clary sage. We want to understand clary sage, right? The plants, the aromatics, the essential oils are not. Um, about a brand, right? It's, it's about a natural product. And then in 2022, we're launching min mentorship programs for all of our certification courses. We're gonna start having uh, monthly meetings to support our students um, as they go through the program. Who we are, so I'm Jade, I'm the founder of this school. Um, this is Lindsay, she's the director of student services. And then Jen Galvin's come on recently um, for our social media. We have Michelle Inslee. She's an instructor here in the United States. She also grades our um, student case studies. Gergay Holiday, he is an instructor in Budapest. He has translated our material into Hungarian. He teaches there and he also reviews case studies, research papers, some of which he selects for his magazine, Aromatica. Ildiko lives in Crete. She is an, our, our instructor there. She will be offering classes not only on distillation, but also aromatherapy certification in Crete, hopefully in the new year, depending on you know, how things are uh, with the pandemic. And then we hope to take a group of students to Crete um, to learn from Ildiko and to um, experience the extraordinary um, diversity of, of aromatic plants and distillation. We have Margot, who's in Ohio. She works with our student forum. So she's the one who responds to students on our student forums currently on Facebook. And then Victoria is our Russia representative. We've just opened up our school in Russia and she is translating um, our material into Russian. So we're very excited about, about that. The school, uh, three years ago, I purchased a 70 acre farm in Stewart. Oh, it says California, it's actually Virginia. So I need to make that correction, it's not California. It's Stewart, uh, Virginia. Um, it's about an hour's drive from Greensboro Airport, if you, if you wanna start looking. And like I said, we have uh, quite a large um, gardens there growing aromatic and medicinal plants. And we will begin uh, offering retreats in March. We're gonna begin with a botanical body care as a live retreat, um, and then move into distillation retreats in April, May, and into June. We offer a number of different programs, so aromatic studies. These are our online courses um, from foundations of aromatherapy to aromatic medicine. We have two courses within the botanical body care um, area, and then we offer a whole lineup of short courses that are considered CE hours if you're already certified in aromatherapy. I do wanna distinguish between our foundations of aromatherapy and foundations of essential oil therapy. And so they're basically identical courses with the exception that the essential oil therapy course does include a module on the internal use of essential oils. You know, I'm one of the few schools that cover uh, internal use. Um, I definitely approach it from not fear-based. Um, I just think it's a really important topic because so many people are using essential oils internally that they are given um, a, 
a framework to do that safely. Um, and then of course we have large aromatherapy supplement companies like nutritional supplements um, or dietary supplements rather, dietary supplements such as doTERRA and Young Living, they come under dietary supplements, um, which is why their products are available for internal use. Um, and so our courses really, we even offer a short course on just the internal use with the goal and the intention of being empowering the person, but also to learn a framework to do that safely, okay? We offer a range of courses with special guests. Uh, Jonathan Benvenitas, uh, Benavides has been um, teaching a few courses for us each year. He's gonna come back next year as well. So from trauma to ADHD to um, depression, he's you know very, he's an amazing teacher. Camelia Lee and Renee uh, Rotkopf are coming in 2022. They'll be offering um, in January, I believe, uh, maybe February, the alchemy of your business and brand. It's kind of weaving in astrology with brand and business uh, creation. I'm very excited. I, I just was in New York visiting them. Then, of course, super proud of our anatomy and uh, physiology course. It, it takes a very, um, what we call pathophysiology instead of just pathology, which is understanding how we might get to ill health. So our anatomy and physiology is available as a standalone course. And then it's a part of our aromatic scholars and aromatic medicine package. Um, and then I wanna, we do have anatomy and physiology in both foundation courses as well. And I hope to do some live um, training on that aspect, just because I think it's really important, you know, that we understand how the human body works and how and why essential oils uh, may uh, be of benefit. We also offer a monograph database, which is a yearly subscription. This is included. Um, we're in the middle of a web, web redevelopment. Our website is being redeveloped. And so once that's launched, the monograph database and previous students as well um, will have uh, access to, to that database. If you're just wanting to get to know us as a school, we offer three free courses. Um, so we have our free introduction to aromatherapy. Oop, I forgot to change these, these lines in the presentation, my apologies. So we have our free introduction to aromatherapy. We have a free introduction to hydrosols that myself and Ildico um, did, uh, I think early, earlier this year. And then a kind of a short course on all about diffusing essential oils. So you can find those on our website if you, you don't know or haven't taken courses from the school and kind of see, you know, how our platform works. We've just become an IFPA approved school, so I'm super happy about that. Um, and then we have NAHA approved um, school status and also we're approved as a continuing education provider. And then we're also for the United States at NCB TMB for massage therapist. Oh, and that's what I was gonna say about the essential oil therapy and uh, the foundations of aromatherapy. Massage therapist can't gain CEUs um, for the internal use of essential oils. That's why we created two separate courses. So if you're a massage therapist looking for CEU hours, um, for the NCB TMB, it's the Foundations of Aromatherapy course um, that is approved um, for massage CE hours. So these are our school approvals. Um, so thank you for attending and I look forward to interacting with you more as a student um, or some of our other free uh, webinars. So thank you, have a wonderful day. And uh...